I was watching the this TV show called Justified. It was on the fourth season, first episode, and they had the famous 1985 bluegrass conspiracy uh, jump of Drew Thornton. Okay. So What the hell? Dear Lord. Santa Claus. So you have this guy named Andrew Carter Thornton II. He's uh, he's out of Lexington. He's a he's a police officer. He's a lawyer. He fought in the, the 101st Airborne um, in the mid 1960s in uh, the Dominican Republic. He was a skydiver. He was an elitist. He came from say say re school s a y r e school. So. Um, I wanted to mention it because the the uh, the TV show Justify got it wrong, so I sort of wanted to do a little informative piece about what the true thing is. So in Justify, in the very beginning, they have a newspaper and it says Corbin, Kentucky on it, and then it's got a picture of Ronald Reagan. It was in the 1980s, but it wasn't 1983, it was 1985. Actually, it was September 11th, 1985. So September 11th, right? Bluegrass Conspiracy. Um, that's, that's something that we got here on September 11th. Corbin, it wasn't in Corbin, Kentucky. Even though Andrew Thornton was from Kentucky, it had happened in Knoxville, Tennessee. He jumps out of the plane with all this, you know, cocaine strapped on him, and he falls in Knoxville, Tennessee, not in Corbin, Kentucky. And then the biggest thing was the storyline of Justified was about, um, they said that the guy who had jumped was a fake, it was a double, so he had actually planted, you know, a double so he could hide himself and he was hiding in the, um, in the, the woods and shit of Appalachia. That's not true. That definitely was Drew Thornton's body. So there was a few things they were certain of, but, you know, through like fingerprints and teeth, they definitely knew that it was his body. And they also know that Drew Thornton had died before he hit, um, before impact on the ground. So either, like, I'm not for sure how they said that he died before the impact on the ground. So I don't know if there was, like, I, it was probably, he was probably killed and then thrown off board. Um, perhaps he was being followed by one of the planes, DEA plane or ATF or some, somebody who controls the aircraft, somebody who controls the skies in, in America, um, which I'm not for sure who would do that. It could be anybody, right? So they, nobody took credit for it. So they could have been following him, kind of forced him to jump out, made him make a hasty um, mistake. They said that he had died before impact, so um, maybe he was getting he got shot up, or there was some other trauma that had happened to him. If there, if he died beforehand and it wasn't a heart attack, then it seems like that it would have had to been that someone was in the plane with him. So one of his friends had to have turned on him and, you know, threw, threw him overboard and then took all the shit. Um, and, but there were planes that had been in the sky and they had been following him. So a little bit of biography uh, of Drew Thornton. You know, I mentioned a little bit about him, but, you know, he's out of Lexington. He's part of the Lexington elite. And he was in, he was a police officer about seven years. He was a lawyer for about seven years or, or four years. Um, he was in the 101st Airborne. He went to the Dominican Republic, right, in the mid-1960s after the revolution. So he's, like, fighting and shit there. Uh, he's a skydiver, and he's uh, the Sayre School. His um, uh, parents are uh, horse breeders, so he's, like, part of the horse culture, the, uh, the whole uh, Churchill Downs people. So... The, the reason why that's important is because justified if they're sitting there saying that there's somebody else that's out there, it, it kind of suggests, you know, that the, well, I don't know, it just, it's not the correct version because he, they would definitely know who it was. And, um, and the way that he did die, it did implicate foul play. So something had happened to Andrew Carter Thornton II. 
Um, he was strapped on. He had fifteen million, uh, fourteen to fifteen million dollars worth of cocaine that strapped on him. He was forty years old. He came out of Paris, Kentucky. He had seventy-seven pounds of coke in an army duffel bag. He used to run guns and drugs as part of the company, aka the uh, Executive Protection Ltd. So he started this Ltd. This sort of in, you know this corporation, but it was a front. And the company was a front for um, a gun running and drug running smuggling ring. So he was a police officer from 1970, 1977, uh, 1970 to 1977. So for four years or seven years, and then he re resigned at the end of 1977 for whatever reason. It doesn't say why he would resign. And um, and when he was a police officer, he would steal drugs and he would sell them. That's when he started actually getting his contacts. Uh, between the drug dealers and also he had contacts um, in the federal agencies, local and state agencies, as well as his own sort of, you know, people out, you know, his own sort of criminal element. So, but it wasn't just a bunch of criminals, it was also people that was within our own governments, our own systems of government. The uh, the way he this operation was working was he would go to, I believe, Columbia and he had all these bales of coke and he, with a transponder on each one of them, so he would throw out a whole bale of coke over the woods of Georgia, Tennessee, and then have a parachute on it. So throw a bale, deploy the parachute, and then it lands, you know, in the middle of nowhere in these woods. And then he would have somebody on the ground go retrieve those bales. And then he would let the Cessna crash miles away. And if you're smart, he would he would steer the Cessna to go a different direction, right? So that way you couldn't see where. It would actually, um, where it would go. Uh, I believe this time in 1985, September 11th, 1985, it crashed in North Carolina, right? So he's in Knoxville, Tennessee, and then it crashes in North Carolina. So that's kind of still going east, still going eastern direction. But that, that did actually change trajectory somewhat. So that was the, that was what he was doing. That's the whole fucking thing, you know. That's how he got his, um... Uh, that's that's how he got his cocaine into the United States from international countries. Um, there's also a whole bunch of information here that I've pulled up. It talks about, there's an article here, September 23rd, 1985. Fred Myers, 84, got up to shave last week in his Knoxville home, looked out the window and saw a body in his backyard. Police found the remains of Andrew Carter Thornton the second 40 snarled on a parachute along with 79 pounds of cocaine two pistols knives and forty five hundred dollars in cash Thornton carried night vision goggles and wore a bulletproof vest police believe he had smuggled the drugs with a value of fifteen million dollars in a twin engine Cessna he put the plane on automatic uh, automatic pilot and bailed out at a treetop level his chute became fouled Instead of landing upright, he hit the ground head first. The wrecked plane was found 70 miles away in North Carolina. A member of the well-to-do family um, in Kentucky, Thornton went to Sewanee, S-E-W-A-N-E-N-E-E, -E -E. <laughs> S-E-W-A-N-E-E -E Military Academy, Sewanee, and then joined the Army and trained as a paratrooper. Back home in Lexington, he became a narcotics officer, then went on to earned a law degree from the University of Kentucky and worked as an attorney, but he soon strayed to the other side of the law. He had been implicated in marijuana smuggling. He was on probation from a drug possession conviction. Um, four years later, he was among the 20 men accused in Fresno, California. So he actually got busted before this incident had happened. Um, in the 80s, so he, he was one of the 25 men accused in Fresno, California in the theft of weapons from the Ch uh, China Lake Naval Weapons Center and of conspiring to smuggle a thousand pounds of marijuana into the United States. Numerous news reports in 1981-82 linked the ring, which included several former Lexington policemen and other Kentuckians to a larger group known as the Company. The larger group was described by a 1980 federal indictment in East St. Louis, Illinois as a dope and gun running syndicate with more than 300 members and 26 million in boats and planes. So there's th the company, there's 300 men in the company, okay? And then there's 26 million dollars that they had 
in boats and planes. So it's they, you know, these people are still around. These things are still out there. Um, that's probably still operating, but under just different names and different, you know, um, organization. Uh, Thornton wasn't charged in the China Lake weapons case, but was indicted at Fresno on one count of conspiracy to import a controlled substance and one count of cons the conspiracy to distribute a controlled substance. The indictment said the charges involved the flight of the plane from a drug run from South America to Kentucky in 1979, and he was named as the pilot. So the uh, eventually he pled no contest, and then the... Um, uh, uh, to the uh, misdemeanor charge and the felony charges were drop, dropped. He was sentenced to six months in prison, fined 500 bucks, placed on probation for five years, and his law license was suspended. Thornton was one of the smartest fellows I ever met. Said a friend in school, he did very well. He came from a very good family and had everything in the world going for him. So, right, there's all that information there. They talked about basically there's a, he's got this company um, in 1977 he's a police officer stealing drugs and then selling them but he was you know a police officer for about seven years uh, but something had happened in 1977 that sort of shook everything up. 24 year old Melanie Flynn had disappeared last seen walking along a busy Lexington street she was never seen again. Melanie had been the girlfriend of Bill Cannon. C-A-N-A-N, -A, -A, a former narcotics officer who was a good friend of Thorne's whom he had met while working for the Lexington Police Department. Cannon was also a member of the company. Those who had known Melanie claimed that she had spent a great deal of time with Thornton and his associates prior to her disappearance. Many suspected foul play even though there was no evidence she had been murdered. Never, uh, nonetheless, rumors spread that she likely had been killed because she knew too much about the company's shady dealings. The rumor brought... Unwelcome attention to Thornton, who at the time was dealing with other problems. Bryant and Thornton's business relationship had reached a critical point. They had found that they were at opposite ends of the spectrum on the question of the direction they wanted to take their expanding business and who would be involved. Bryant had developed plans to ally with international drug kingpins Lee and Jimmy Chagra, who allegedly ran the country's largest heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and firearms distribution center. According to Sally Denton, Bryant believed that a merger between the two enterprises would expand the company's business significantly and lead to even bigger profits. Thornton, though, was far from happy with the idea of joining forces with the brothers. The two were known to be ruthless, and worse yet, they had attracted the attention of the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. The Chagra brothers just seemed like bad news to Thornton, yet against his better judgment, he agreed to the merger of the two outfits, according to Dune. It wouldn't take long before the Chagras and their violent ways would start to tear the company apart and put it on everyone's most wanted list. On November 21st, 1978, U.S. Attorney James Kerr, the lead prosecutor investigating the Chagra network, was shot at but not hit while he sat in his car in San Antonio, Texas. One month later, Lee Chagra was gunned down in his office, and in May 1979, U.S. District Judge John Wood Jr., known as Maximum John for his tough sentences, was shot behind his San Antonio home on the same day Jimmy Chagra was set to go on trial before Wood on drug charges. Torsten Ove reported for Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Judge Wood was the first federal judge to be assassinated in the century, Sally Ditton wrote. More murders would follow, according to Sally Ditton, including a mobster blown up in his car and a witness found strangled and dumped into a swamp. The high-profile attacks ratcheted up the pressure. Dunn reported and focused unwarranted attention on the company, threatening their business and their lives. Thornton had had it. He didn't want anything more to do with the Chagra organization, fearing that involvement with it would lead to the downfall of the company, yet Brian strongly disagreed. He not only wanted to continue a business relationship with the organization, but intended to head their entire South American operation trading weapons for cocaine. Brian Thornton's differences drove a wedge between them, leading, them, uh, leading to the breakup of the company. The company, right? The Executive Protection LTD. Brian continued with business as usual, but not for long. In January 1980, a maid at a Philadelphia hotel informed her manager she smelled marijuana. In one of the hotel rooms, the police had been contacted. When they entered the room, they quickly realized they had stumbled upon a much bigger drug bust than they had initially expected. Inside the room, which was registered to Bryant, they found a ledger with a list of names and phone numbers, a telephone scrambling device, 25000 in cash, semi 
automatic weapons and at least to a warehouse in Lexington. Dunn reported it was clear that the police had hit the mother load. Soon thereafter, Bryant was tracked to a Philadelphia airport and arrested. In the interim, the police investigated the warehouse that was also in Bryant's name. Inside, they found even more incriminating evidence, including $250,000 worth of weapons, $250,000 worth of weapons, ammunition, and a night vision scope equipment that Bryant's cousins uh, had stolen. Parachute failed to deploy properly.